All right. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of John, chapter 18. John 18, starting in verse 5. We're on a series uh, entitled, The Names of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with those names, we are uh, dealing with different things that the Bible says about the names of God and Jesus Christ. And today we're going to be talking about the I Am He. Notice the way I worded that. There's the I Am, and then there's the I Am He. In John chapter 18, we're going to look at verse 5. The Bible says, They answered Him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said to them, now what's going on here? Let's go back, I'm sorry, let's go back a verse. Uh, Look at verse 4. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them, as soon as he, as soon as he had um, said unto them, I am he, they went backward and went to the ground. Amen. Then answered he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which... Uh, fulfill which he spake of them which thou gavest me have I lost none now Jesus here in this passage is in the garden of Gethsemane and in the garden of Gethsemane he had just got finished praying Uh, he had told his disciples uh, could you not tarry with me one hour can you not just spend an hour in prayer with me I think about that, you know, I think about the things that God wants us to do and the faithfulness that He wants us to be a part of. Can you not tarry one hour? Uh, There's a message in that, Brother Earl. I mean, uh, you know, the the saints of God are so busy, but God wants to know, can you tarry with me one hour on Sunday morning? Can you tarry with me one hour on Sunday evening? Can you tarry with me one hour on Wednesday? Could you tarry with me at the prisons, you know, and share the gospel with people? Uh, the different things that God is doing in the church world today. We begin so busy sometimes uh, or so uh, caught up in life uh, that we get tired and weary and our eyes begin to get heavy and we begin to stop seeing the vision that God wants us to see. Amen? And God wants you to see things like He sees them, not the way the world sees them. Amen? When we were out there on that street corner yesterday preaching, uh, it was just two of us, uh, But when we were out there telling the gospel to those people, there's a lot of people out there that don't understand why we're out there on that street corner, why we're out there pointing the finger at them, telling them uh, that they must repent or they're going to perish. They better turn or they're going to burn. They better get it right or the devil is going to have his day with them in hell. And they don't understand that. But see, I don't see things the way the world sees them. I see things the way God sees them. I see things the way the Lord says to you, you need to look at things. You see, God wants you to tarry. It was after this that the... Now, Jesus went away and prayed three times. Every time He came back, the disciples were asleep. Third time He came back, He said, go ahead and go to sleep. It's okay. I mean, what's going to happen is going to happen. What's going to be is going to be. Amen? Amen. And uh, as soon as he had done that, the Bible says here in verse 5, he asked him, he said, Who seek ye? When the crowd came. He knew what was getting ready to happen. He knew that the opposition party, Brother Rocky, was right there and they were getting ready to take him down. He wasn't afraid. He wants to know, Who are you looking for? See? Jesus Christ asked the same question today. He asks it to a lot of churches today. Why? Because a lot of churches have Jesus on the outside. Amen? uh, Jesus ain't in the inside of the church anymore a lot of places. He's outside knocking to try to get back in. And they're seeking, but they don't even know what they're looking for. They're looking around trying to find something. (coughs) 
find some peace, find some serenity, find some comfort, find something that will give them a peace of mind about things. Uh, and they're looking in all the wrong places. Amen. Amen. What we need to do is we need to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He said, who seek ye? And then they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Well, if you're looking for Him, let's make sure you're, you're exactly looking for what you claim you're looking for. Be careful for what you ask for, you might get it. That's right. Amen. I hear people all the time come, you know, call me up and say, we're looking for a Bible-believing church. I say, well, this is it. They get in here, they get in here, sit around for a while, and they realize, oh, this ain't what I, I bargained for. Uh, well, well, are you looking for a Bible-believing church or not? I didn't, you didn't say I'm looking for a Baptist church. You didn't say I was looking for a denominational church. You said I'm looking for a Bible-believing church. Hey, that's what we are. Amen. That's what we do. We practice the Bible. We believe the Bible. We walk in the Bible. We preach the Bible. We teach the Bible. If that's what you're looking for, and that's what you're seeking for, that's what you'll find here. But if you're not, it'll tell on you after a while when the Word goes forth, and you get offended for the Word's sake. Amen. You'll leave. And that's what a lot of people do. They leave. If we had everybody here that we had when we first started, brother... You couldn't, you couldn't fill this place up and you couldn't fill the place up next door that we're going to deal with. Amen. They say one thing with their mouth, but in their heart they're really looking for something else. Amen. See, you've got to be careful with that. This crowd here said they were looking for Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He put them to the test. He said, I am He. You know what happened when He said that? They went backward. There was power in those words. You know why? He won't just say it, I'm the person you're looking for. That's not what Jesus said here. When they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he come back on the other side of that and said, I am he. He took on the name of God there, and he pronounced it to them, and the power of that name knocked them back. And they fell backwards. Then they got up. And he said, who seek you? Mm-hmm. They said, well, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> uh, are you him? Jesus answered, I've told you I am he. See? He pulled back on the power a little bit. They didn't fall back that second time, but they were nervous. I'm sure they were. I mean, think about this, folks. I mean, here comes a crowd at you, and you say, I am he, and the power of God hits them. I mean, Benny Hinn would be envious. Yeah. Amen. I mean, he would look at that and say, man, I want that. All right, take your Bible and look at Isaiah chapter 43. These fakers always have to find a way to counterfeit something the Lord's doing. Isaiah 43. Now let's see what Jesus did there when he said what he said in John 18. Look at Isaiah 43 and we're going to start with verse 10. Here is a verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses love to run to to try to prove that they're the Jehovah's Witnesses and I love to go to it to show them exactly what they ain't. Verse 10 says, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. You know, in their Bible it says, saith Jehovah. And my servant, whom I have chosen, they claim to be the servant of the Lord. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Now I stop right there with him. I say, now read that verse again. I want you to make sure you get it real good and down pat in your heart. He said, I am he there, right? And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay. I said, now don't back out on me now when I get ready to show you the next verse. And then I run them to John 18 where Jesus takes that title and puts it, applies it to himself. And then they dance around. Stop dancing. This ain't the dance hall. I mean, this is what the Word of God says. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Old Testament. And the true witnesses of Jesus Christ are going to witness to the fact that He is the I Am. He. See? He says, I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. That's a good verse you can show a Jehovah's Witness or anybody else that claims that Jesus is a created God to show them that how foolish that statement is. God here says in this verse, there's no God formed before me and there's none after me. 
Now, if Jesus is a created God, then He would be a God formed after Jehovah. And that's false. Because He says that's not the case here. So either Jesus is God Almighty, the second person of the divine trinity, or He's not who He claimed He is, and we can shut the book, go home and play golf or do something else. Amen. I mean, help yourself, go have some fun. I mean, after all, you know, we've been wasting our time here. But if He is who He says He is, and the verses in these passages attest to that, then you have an obligation to believe it, receive it, and walk in it. Not just believe it. Amen. See? The Bible says, I am He. Alright, now look at verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am He, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let? He's the one. He's the one. Now, go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus makes a statement in connection to that uh, phrase when He ties it to Himself. And He lets you know something about it that is paramount that you pay attention to. What does it say here in verse 24? It says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. How's that for a sermon? How's that for a starting statement in a sermon? You're going to die in your sins, buddy. Amen. When I get on that corner over there, I don't pull no punches. I point my finger straight at those cars and I tell them, you're going to die in your sins if you don't get right with God. A guy yesterday, uh, Earl heard him. I didn't hear him. I wish I'd have heard him. He said, uh, there is no God. He was screaming as he was running. By. <laughs> he was screaming. Uh, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. You fool. <laughs> I mean, you, gonna, you, you think you're smart. And uh, We had some motorcycle guys. I don't know if you paid attention to that. Yeah. They got out there and they started shouting. And they, they realized I won't pay no mind to them then. And then they started revving their engines up. So I got louder. Yeah. Amen. And I turned right over there and I started pointing at them. Amen. That's called boldness, folks. That's called being filled with the Spirit of God and not afraid of your enemy. That's right. Amen. I mean, people can stare at you like a tree full of owls or they can get in bull with you and get with the program. Amen. But it don't deter what God is saying. And when Jesus Christ says in verse 24, He said, I said unto you, I can imagine when Jesus said that, He's pointing at them. I said unto you uh, that you're going to die in your sins. Amen. <clears throat> then He says this on the back side of that. Said, For if you believe not that I am what? You shall what? Die in your sins. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a verse that you better pay attention to doctrinally. As a born-again Christian in the body of Christ, if you're saved, that is a requirement. That's not an option. That's not a suggestion. You have to believe that Jesus is the I am He. And if you don't believe that, you're not saved. According to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And these people out here running around and say, well, I just believe he was a good person and nothing more. Well, then you're not saved. And the preacher that lied to you and told you you were saved, he's lost too. That's right. Amen. Amen. I mean, you've got to start taking the Word of God for what it says and walking in it and believing it. The Bible says here, I am here. You shall die in your sins if you don't believe it. Now, go to Isaiah chapter 46 verse 4. Forty-six, verse four. Look, go back to verse three, and we'll get the context. Verse three says, "Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb, and even to your old age, I am He." And even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Notice God there takes on that title there. He says, I am He. He says, I am He and I'll take care of you from the time you're born to the time you leave this earth and the time you die. God says, I am He. I will be whatever I need to be to, in your life to make sure you're what you need to have. Yes. Amen. Thank God He's like that. 
When we were talking to those inmates last night, uh, we were talking about some uh, things concerning the image of God. And I'll tell you something about those guys. They love the Word of God. They're hungry for it. I preached an hour and a half in that place last night. And they wanted me to go another hour and a half. But I couldn't because there's time restraints. We snuck that other 30 minutes in there. I mean, because uh, we didn't have an officer in there. But, uh, but anyway, um, those guys are hungry. And I thought, I told Earl on the way home, I said, ain't that something? Those guys sit there for an hour and a half and want more. And you got people out here that are free, walking around, that can't wait for the preacher to shut up after 30 minutes. Amen. Amen. What a shame. Yeah. What a shame. Amen. I mean, Jesus Christ, the living water, the bread of life, and He's giving you things that's going to help you live for eternal life forever in heaven. And people are out here hungry for the world, but not hungry for God. Amen. God help us. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41, and look over here at verse 4. Look at verse 4 here. The Bible said, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am He. That's exactly what Jesus Christ said in John 18. So Jesus Christ is the I am He. Praise God. Alright. The next thing your Bible tells you about Jesus Christ and the I am's is found in Isaiah 43 verse 25. Isaiah 43 verse 25. Isaiah 43 verse 25 says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions from mine own, for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. You ought to put a star by that one. You need to put a star by that. Let me tell you why. Because if you're born again today, you have a privilege and you have a blessing from God that any lost man, if he knew what was going on, he would beg you to give, give him the truth about it. Because God told you there that your sins and your trespasses and your iniquities are gone, buddy. They're gone. He said, I blotted them out. I've taken them away. That's Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Jesus is the one that takes away your sins. Jesus' blood is what gets rid of your sin problem. Amen. It's the blood of Christ. So this is a prophecy here. It's a prophecy concerning the Lord in the future. Even though it's written in Isaiah, He said, I, even I am He that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. Why did He say that? For my own sake. For my own sake in that I'm going to have me a bride and she's going to be pure and she's going to be holy and she's going to be separate and she's going to be right and she's going to be glorious and she's going to be heavenly. Hey, she's going to be right with God and praise the Lord for it. Yes. And when people see her, she's different. Yes. Amen. Amen. She can hold her head up high. She don't have to run around like a bullfrog with her lips poked out. Uh, and like a man running around with his head poked down in the ground somewhere like he's looking for dirt in the ground. Hey, uh, you got your sins blotted out, buddy. You can hold your head up high and praise God and clap your hand and raise them to God and say, I am delivered, uh, praise God, because of Jesus Christ. His blood sets me free. Amen. He gives me the power to live, man. I got something to live for now. I don't need to go blow my brains out. <laughs> Amen. These people out here in Hollywood, they got all the money in the world, all the fame in the world, all the prestige, all the press, all the accolades, and they still blow their brains out. Yep. What's the problem? The problem's a heart problem. Right. Yes. Amen. Until you get the heart right, the other stuff ain't going to matter. Right. You can have all the money in the world, buddy, but if your heart ain't right, you're still going to hell. Right. And somewhere inside of you, you know that. You got trouble. <laughs> you know, Robin Williams, he, he, he went out there and killed himself. What a, sh what a tragedy. Everybody was talking about what a shame that is. It is a shame. It is a shame. He had a lot to offer. But let me tell you something. He didn't know Jesus Christ or he wouldn't have done what he did. Amen. <laughs> That's the problem. All right. He's the one that blots out your trespasses. Go to Colossians. Colossians. 
There's no remission of sin without Jesus Christ. And there's no remission of sin without the blood atonement being applied. Go to Colossians 1 and look down here at verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 20. Right after he tells you that Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe in verses 15 through 19, he tells you in verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and ye that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereby I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up with that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church. Now let me tell you something. You want some peace? You got to go to the cross to get it. There's no peace outside the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's high time, it's high time the churches get back to preaching the cross. It's high time that the preachers stop politicking and stop entertaining and start preaching the word of God. Amen. It's high time that churches get hungry for the word and stop getting hungry for the world. Amen. The world has come into the church house and Jesus has left. Amen. That's why he says over there in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man uh, open the door and let me come in, I'll sup with him. You know who he said that to? He didn't say that to a bunch of sinners that didn't know God. He said that to a church. He's outside looking in. And that's a problem. Amen. That's a big problem. Go to Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. The Bible says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with uh, him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you how many trespasses? Do you see that thing? That's what he said over there in Isaiah 43, 25. I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. And yet here we find that it is actually Jesus Christ that does the blotting out. Through his death and by the cross. Through the blood atonement. The Bible says, he says, blotting out the handwriting uh, of ordinances, verse 14, that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way and nailed it to his, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made uh, a shoe of them openly, trumpeting over them in it through the cross. Praise God for the cross. Yes. Amen. That cross is, uh, should never, ever, ever become a, a side piece in the church. It should be the front and center piece. That's why we put what we put back here behind me as a reminder of what Christ did for the sinner. That's what it is. It's a visual reminder of what Jesus Christ did for you. Never forget what the cross means. Never forget the fact that Jesus Christ suffered on Calvary's cross to set the sinner free. Amen. It's the cross that makes the difference. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 24, being justified, how? How, how are we justified? Say that again. That means you can't do nothing to earn it. That means you can't do nothing to keep it. That means it's given to you freely and it's freely given to you and that's how you keep it freely. I get so sick of these uh, self-righteous Pharisees running around telling people, well, if you're smoking, you're not going to heaven or if you're drinking, you're not going to heaven or if you're doing this, you're not going to heaven or if you're doing that, you're not going to heaven. Let me tell you something. The grace of God's free. If a man receives it and God gives it to him, it's his Amen. Now his sins might he have, he may have to reap some things in his flesh 
for what he's doing in the flesh. I won't argue against that. But I'm telling you, what you do in this flesh don't affect that soul if it's saved by God. God. Amen. The Bible says he justifies you freely. There ain't nothing you can do to get it, and there ain't nothing you can do to maintain it. Amen. Amen. If you did, it would not be free. It would be works-based. And we in this church teach you that a man is saved by grace, freely, by the grace of God, and justified freely by the grace of God, plus nothing. I mean, if you do the math, you figure it up. It'll always equal zero. Amen. I mean, you can't do anything to earn merit with God. It's unmerited favor. Amen. Now, I believe when a Christian gets saved, I believe they ought to live right. I believe they ought to live a certain way and I believe they ought to start uh, working on this flesh and getting it under subjection to Jesus Christ. But that comes through the Word of God being preached and practiced and walked in. Amen. But that ain't got nothing to do with your justification. A man's saved, saved. Ain't no devil in hell that can pluck him out and ain't nobody in the, per- in, in the world that can pluck him out. Including himself. First thing God saved you from according to Colossians 2 was yourself. And God knows that you were a mess when God saved you. Amen. And when He saved you, He got you separated from the thing that was your worst enemy. Your worst enemy won't hell and your worst enemy won't the devil. Your worst enemy was you. Right. That's right. Amen. And He cut you loose from you. And He spiritually circumcised you and He separated you and then He protected you from you. <laughs> Well, how did he do that, preacher? He sealed you off with the Holy Ghost. And he said, nothing can come inside this part I saved and contaminate it ever again. That's why you're justified freely. You can walk in that grace. Now, if you don't live right and do right, God will just uh, knock you in the head sometimes. He might take you out early. Amen. He'll make you wish you were dead. (laughs) But uh, he'll get your attention one way or the other. The Bible says anybody that belongs to Jesus Christ, he'll chastise them. They're his children. He'll, He'll whip you. He'll put you out in that woodshed and he'll wear you out. He'll make you, he'll whip you so bad you'll think you're dying. Amen. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, it's good medicine. It's like that castor oil that your grandma used to give you when you were a baby and you hated that stuff going down. But at the end of the day, it made you better because you didn't uh, feel sick. Because you say, if you were sick, you won't want to tell nobody because, (laughs) because (laughs) you knew what was coming if you did. Amen. The Bible says being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is where? Where is it at? It's in Christ Jesus, right? That's what that verse says, verse 24. It says grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means it ain't in Buddha. That means it ain't in Allah. That means it ain't in uh, the Pope in Rome, the saints. Uh, it, don't, it ain't in Mary. It ain't in nobody else that you can think of. It's in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Period. And that's who we need to preach. Paul said, I would know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him what? Crucified. Crucified. See? Who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in what? In your good works? And you living right? And you living holy? Nope. In His blood. That's our only hope. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That is our only hope. Yes, it is. There was a episode in Star Wars. I don't know if it was the first episode that they played back in the 70s where uh, one of the ladies was tuning in and she says, You're our only hope, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You remember that part? Well, she kept saying that over and over in the little, um, in the little thing there. And I thought to myself, after I, after, I got, after I got right with God and got in the Word like I am now, I thought, ain't that something? We're telling all these young people and all these people out here in the world that their hope is in some stupid, frail, sinful, defiled, wicked human being when it should be in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Your hope ain't in Hollywood. It ain't in uh, Rome. It ain't in uh, D.C. It certainly ain't with our president. Uh, it's in Jesus Christ and Him alone. 
I got news for you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a conservative and I'm a Republican, but I'm going to tell you something else. It ain't in Donald Trump either. Right. Amen. Yeah. Donald Trump can't save you. He can't help you out uh, on your spiritual journey. Only Jesus Christ can. Amen. Right. It ain't in the Democrats. It ain't in the Republicans. It ain't in any other party you want to come up with, the polka dot party or the conservative party or the Constitution party. It's in Jesus Christ. Uh, and until we get back to emphasizing that to the masses, we won't see people get saved like they ought to be. The reason people aren't getting converted in churches anymore is we've took the blood out, we've took the cross out, and we took Christ out. And to put the world in its place. That's right. The Bible says God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare what? His righteousness. Understand that. It's His righteousness, not yours. See, when I came to Jesus Christ... I had a righteousness that was self-righteous. That's what they call it. It's self-righteousness. You know, I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, get out there and door knocking and stuff like I have been in the past and just knock on those doors and uh, you tell them people about their need for Christ and you say, well, I'm a good person preacher. That's all they always, that's their MO. That's what they always go to. I am a good person. I do this and I do that and I, 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 I. Well, I don't give a flip what you do. What I care about is whether you're saved. And your I, I, I can't get you up above this building here much less than heaven. Amen. Amen. You can do all the good works in the world. You can be Mother Teresa for all I care, and you're still going to go to hell like a bullet. She's screaming in here right now because she wished she'd come back one minute so she could put her faith and trust in Christ and not her good works. Amen. I bet you she ain't playing around with her beads today. <laughs> Amen. I'm just telling you, folks. I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm just telling you the truth. It's His righteousness that saves you. <clears throat> the Bible says his, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. That or what? When God saves you, He forgives you not only your present sins, your past sins. He goes over into the future and He deals with your future sins. Now, if you don't think that's amazing grace, how sweet the sound, then your wood's wet. Because I'm going to tell you something. Not only does He cover your past, He covers your present, He covers your future. That's why He says, I am the first and I am the last. I am Alpha, I am Omega. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. I'm all that in between too. I'll take care of the whole thing for you if you'll trust me. If you'll trust me. The Bible says uh, here that it's through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him, which what? Believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law, law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without what? You can't do, uh, you can't do nothing to help God out. These self-righteous Christians think they're helping God out. They're not helping God out. He's helping you out. Amen. Amen. He's the one that's putting you on this uh, thing to say, hey, you need me. I don't need you. Let's not get that thing twisted. The way the preachers preach today is like God needs us. I've heard some of them say that. God don't need you. You need God. Amen. You need the atonement. He, he was perfectly fine without you in eternity past, and He'll be perfectly fine without you in the future. Right. Amen. Uh, but you need Him. You won't find in the past, and you ain't going to be fine in the future without Him. You're going to be burning like a toast. Uh, amen. You're going to be crispy. <laughs> and you ain't going to be able to get no water, and you're going to be screaming and begging God for mercy, and there will be no mercy. These dumb preachers that run around and tell you that hell is not real, it's, it's just a figment of the imagination or it's a, a metaphor and it's, uh, here's, here's one of them, Billy Graham says hell is just separation from God and that pot belly pig in Rome says the same thing, he says it's just separation from God, that's what it is. Let me tell you something, those rascals wouldn't know hell if they hit them in the face but they're going to find out one day what it is and they're going to find out how real it is. Hell is not separation from God, hell is being in the very presence of God without a glorified body and burning forever. Amen. That's what it is. David said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art with me there. What do you mean separation from God? You can't even go to hell without Him being there looking at you. That's right. Amen. 
You know what the fire in hell comes from? It comes from Him. And the Bible tells you in Proverbs chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 2 that when He is burning you, He's laughing at you while He's doing it. That's not the God of chosen and that's not the God of Hollywood and that's not the God of, uh, what is her name that did the Son of God movie? Uh, yeah, that lady, that little, uh, anyway, she's, uh, she's running around telling people, oh, just God, you wouldn't do anything like that. And God is so loving and God is so pure and God's so wonderful and it's just a bed full of roses and let's eat some donuts and Twinkies while we're at it and, uh, and have us a good time. And let me tell you something, the God of that Bible is a just God, he's a holy God, and he will not compromise his word to get you out of hell or keep you out of hell. You got to go by way of the cross, buddy. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And if you want to try to come some other way, he describes you in John chapter 10 as a hireling, a thief, and a robber. Amen. That's what he describes you as. Yes. That's Jesus Christ in the Bible. Now, I'm not knocking you looking at movies and stuff, but you better understand something. There's two sides of that thing. Yes, there's a humanity to Christ. I agree with that. But there's a deity to Him as well. Amen. And what we're looking at here is the deity. We're looking at the part of Him that you better not cross the wrong way. Go to Psalm chapter 2. I'll show you something. Psalm chapter 2. This is a millennial passage, but it can apply anytime. Go down here to verse 11. Verse 11. Well, better yet, let's go to verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. Now, I'll tell you what, that's the burden of a preacher. A preacher will spend his days perplexed. And why people don't come to church, why people don't get into the message, why people don't appreciate the message, why people don't appreciate the ministry of the Lord that He has put in the church. He'll sit there and why do the people choose to do this versus this over here? That's what David's saying. Why do people choose to do devilment versus the things of God that have a blessing on them? Why do people choose to go out here to destructive things that will destroy them instead of over here doing things that will lift them up and edify and build them up. That's what he's saying. He's saying, why do the heathen rage and why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. See, you find that out when you stand out there on the corner with a Bible and a scripture sign, how they think about Jesus Christ. You think they're in love with Jesus Christ in Wayne County? You got another thing coming, honey. That is not the truth. They tell you out there on that street corner exactly what they think about it. All you got to do is hold a Bible up and a scripture sign up and they will point at you and tell you what's in their heart. And it ain't godly. The Bible says here... It says, against the Lord and against His anointing. Let us take ban- break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now look at verse 4. And see if this matches Hollywood. He that sitteth in the heavens shall do what? Laugh. Oh, you thought I was kidding, didn't you? <laughs> He'll laugh at them. The Bible says, laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. You know what derision is? Derision is a man that's laughing so hard that he bows over. Have you ever seen anybody laugh like that? I've seen some people laugh like that. I've laughed like that. I've laughed so hard that I just went straight over like that and I just couldn't even contain myself. And I mean, I laughed so hard I started crying. That's what the Lord says He'll do. He will have them in derision. The Bible says here in verse 5, Then shall He speak unto them what? In His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Yeah, have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion? I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the innermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's millennium. Then shall he break, uh, then, 
Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron and shalt dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. If they don't submit, God says He'll take them and dash them to pieces. That's the God of the Bible. Alright, the Bible says next, Be wise now therefore ye kings, be instructed ye judges of the earth. That's the Supreme Court judges. That's the kings. That would be the presidents and all the leaders of the world. He's getting ready to tell them something. You know what he's getting ready to say to them? Look at verse 11. Serve the Lord with what? Fear. Fear. Well, let me tell you something. Where does the fear of the Lord begin with? The Bible. The Bible. That's how you learn to fear of the Lord. That's Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says that you take these words, you meditate upon them, you study them, and learn the fear of the Lord. A man cannot fear God if he don't have a Bible. Now, one of the first things God said to the kings that were going to be on the throne was, you make a copy of that book and you sit it beside the throne and you meditate on it day and night. When's the last time you seen a president of this country do that? When did you see a president that actually hand copied the Bible and sat it beside his throne and sat there and said, now we're going to judge you according to this, not anything else. Don't kid me, man. <laughs> the Bible says here, he says, serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with what? You better tremble when you're in His presence. Now look at verse 12. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and ye perish from the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in Him. i tell you what that kiss the Son means. When you come before a king in biblical times, you would go down there to that throne, you would stand a certain distance away from that throne, and until that sepulcher was held out to you, you didn't go any further. Once that sepulcher was held out to you, you came up to Him, you bowed on your knees to Him, and you kissed His feet. And if you did not honor Him by kissing His feet, His wrath was kindled against you. And the Bible tells you that when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of David in Israel, anybody that comes into His presence better bow their knee and kiss His feet, or He will destroy them. I can't wait, brother, to see Barack Hussein Obama bow his knee to Jesus Christ and kiss those feet before he goes off into the lake of fire. Amen. 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 And that's what every lost man is going to be required to do. Not just kings. Alright. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Isaiah 43 again. Let's go back over there. Let's look at Isaiah 43 again. Isaiah 43. Let's look at a few more here before we close. The next thing he says here is found in verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is what? Jesus Christ is called the Savior in the New Testament. It's God in the Old Testament. Do we have two Saviors? No, they're one and the same. The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ in the New. He reveals the Father. See? The Trinity says that there is God the Father, which is the soul of God, God the Son, which is the body of God, and God the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of God. And if you want God, you have to get all three together and look at that. Yes. And Jesus Christ said the only person of God you can visually see is Him. He's got the body. Jesus took on a body so you could see God. Amen. Isaiah 43, I'll tell you what I love it. Isaiah 43, 11, it says here, I, even I, am the Lord, and there is beside me there is no Savior. Now look down here at verse uh, 15. Verse 15, he says this, I am the Lord. Now notice these are all caps. Your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your what? What did they put on the cross, Christ? King of Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You know what happened when that was put above His head? That thief read that placard and he got saved. Why? Because that was Scripture. Amen. As soon as that thing got written by Pilate and put on that cross, 
God put his inspiration on it and that man read it and he believed what he was reading and he said, Lord, that what he said? Yes. If you've got a King James Bible, it says, Lord. If you've got anything else, it says, Sir. <laughs> if you've got a King James Bible, it says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy what? A kingdom requires you to be a what? King. He believed what he was reading. And Jesus Christ said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And when Jesus said that, he was getting ready to go to the heart of the earth. And yet that thief, because he died after Christ's death, he went up. So Jesus Christ took that thief and went straight up to paradise with him while he went straight down to the heart of the earth. What does that mean, preacher? That means that Jesus Christ can go in two different directions at the same time because he's God and he's omnipresent. Now you put your head around that. You said Jesus can't do that. Well, then you're stupid because, I mean, if you don't think that Jesus can be in more than one place at the same time, how do you explain the new birth? Is Jesus in you, brother? Yep. Is He in you? Well, how's He over there and over here at the same time? <laughs> Mary can't do that. <laughs> the Pope can't do that. He wish He could, but He can't. None of them can do that. Benny Hinn can't do that. Swagger can't do that. Copeland can't do that. TBN can't do it, but Jesus can. Jesus can be in you at the same time here and there and everywhere else. Amen. And not mess up the fact that He's on the throne. Alright, go to Isaiah 43 and look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Fear not. Here's something else that Jesus tells us. And if you'll notice in the Gospels many times when Jesus is talking, He'll say what? Fear not. When He was in that boat and that storm came up and His disciples are sitting there panicking and having a meltdown and Jesus is back in the back of the boat there in the corner sleeping. And here's a storm coming through there and it's rocking that boat and that boat's about to sink. But they forgot who they were dealing with and they forgot who was in the boat with them. And that's like a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians forget who's in the boat with them. They get to panicking and worrying about things and they get to panicking and worrying about, oh, we're getting ready to sink. We're getting ready to be destroyed. We're getting ready to lose our house. We're getting ready to lose this. We're getting ready to lose that. Don't forget who's in the boat with you, honey. Jesus is there. And as long as He's there, He's going to be all right. God will make a way for you. I told those guys at the prison last night, any time that Jesus was in the presence of somebody, they never died. Did you ever notice that? You ever notice that when you read your Bible? Nobody ever died in His presence. Nobody. They were either already dead when He got there, or they died after He left. But they never died in front of Him. Why? Because nobody can die in His presence. That's why He had to tarry for four days with Lazarus. They came to Him and said, Hey, Lazarus is sick. What did the Bible tell you that Jesus did when He heard that? It says He tarried there. Why did He do that? He wanted to make sure Lazarus was good and dead before He got there. Why? Because He had the intention of raising him from the dead so they could see that Jesus not only has the power to heal somebody, He has the power to pick them up from death and bring them back to life. So he had to make sure he died first. He knew if he got there too soon, he wouldn't die. <laughs> Fear not. You'll see that all through the Gospels when Jesus is talking to him. He'll tell that woman, he'll tell that woman that's got a... Fear not. He'll tell that man that's got a sick... Child, Fear not. He tells the disciples in that boat that day, he said, Fear not. Be of good cheer, I'm here. <laughs> And he says, peace be still. And that thing went calm. Yes. Well, you could have threw a rock across that thing and it would have skipped all the way across that <laughs> lake. Mm -hmm. Amen. It was so flat. <laughs> when Jesus comes into the room, He fixes whatever's going on wrong. You've got to trust Him. Fear not. That's what He's saying here in these verses. What else does He say in this verse? He says, fear not. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In verse 5, He says, fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. That's a promise to Israel. But spiritual application is, he says, I am with thee. 
What did Jesus say in Matthew 28 right before he went up to the third heaven? He said, Lo, I am with thee always. See that? He's taking on the characteristic of God here. He said, I'm with you always. You ain't got to worry. Don't fear. I'm here. Even though I'm bodily, you can't see me. I'm here. See? Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. Alright. One last thing we'll look at. Is Revelation chapter 1 verse 17. Revelation 1 17. In Revelation 1 17, Jesus Christ says this. When I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet as dead. That's a good place to be. I'll tell you what. When you get the presence of Jesus Christ, the best place for you to be is at His feet. Lay flat on your face. That's a good place to be. I have found that most of my prayers that really that needed answering and that were urgent, that were serious, was, was times when I got on my face before God and laid flat on my face. Yes. And God honored that. I've told y'all the story about when I was living out there on Highway 55. And uh, my daughter Naomi was just a baby. No, no milk, no formula, no food in the house. I mean, when I say the cupboards were bare, I mean, I'm talking about dust was flying out when you opened the cupboards. Nothing in the refrigerator. I've been out of work for three months. My rent was due. Getting ready to be evicted from a place I was renting. Uh, avoiding the landlord. You know how it is. You know, I mean, you know. Listen. God, I, I got in there and I said, you know what, I'm going to get in here on my face. I got everybody out of the house. I said, I need y'all to leave me alone this afternoon. I got in there on that living room floor <laughs> and that little trailer that was out there in the middle of nowhere behind some wooded area. When you drive by the road there, you wouldn't be able to see it unless you knew where it was at. And I got on my face. I stripped down to nothing and got in there and laid on my face before God. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to get up off this floor until I have peace of mind about this thing. You're going to give me an answer today, please. I need an answer. I need help. I'm in desperation. My baby's hungry. We ain't got no food. There's nothing going on in here except despair. I need help. I'm your child. You promised you would never uh, let the righteous be forsaken, nor God's seed begging bread, and I'm begging. Help me. I laid in that floor about four Four hours, maybe two or three hours, somewhere along in there. I don't remember how long it was. It was a long time. And there was a peace that came in that room, Sister Kathy. The Spirit of God came in that room so heavy, boy, you could cut that thing with a knife and lift it in that went and settled down in that room. It was like a fog in there. And and God came in that room with me and let me know everything's okay. He's gonna take care of it. I got up with peace of mind and said, it's going to be fine. I'm, I'm good. I don't know how it's going to happen. God's going to take care of it. That evening at 6 o'clock, here come a lady on a station wagon, parked at my house, and she had a, a, a car full of groceries. Steaks, pork chops, I mean, you name it, she had it. And she said, knocked on that door, she said, I know you don't know me when I answered the door. She said, I know you don't know me. But I was driving down the road today and God spoke to me and told me to go fill my car up with food and bring it to this trailer. There's my food. Yes. Next day I get out there to the mailbox and the landlord's out there and he said, Hey, been meaning to talk to you. I said, I'm sure you have. <laughs> and I get over there to him and I told him my circumstance, told him my situation. He held his head down there for a minute, sitting in that old pickup truck. I'll never forget. He was sitting over on the side there. He's sitting there. You could tell he was thinking. He said, I'll tell you what, Mark. He said, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to do this today for you because you're a good guy. You know, you're a Christian, and uh, I know you love the Lord. He said, um, whatever day or whatever month you go back to work, Consider your rent paid up for that all that time. And don't worry about that past rent. And just start paying me that month. God took care of my bill. My light bill got paid the next day by a church in the area. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ will take care of you. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. That's what we're getting ready to read here. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. There it is again. I am the first and the last. You don't need anything else when you got Jesus Christ. He's your first, He's your last. What do you need anything else for? Amen. I tell people all the time, they say, what do I need, preacher, uh, to start out the ministry and start out with uh, getting out there and learning the Word of God and stuff? What, what tools do I need? I said, all you need is a King James Bible. If you want something uh, to help you out, a strong concordance and prayer and get on your knees and get you some neology. And God will show you the rest. Amen. Get you a Bible-believing church that's teaching and preaching the Word of God and plug into it. And stay faithful to it. And God will bless you. Amen. You don't need a college education. You don't need a bachelor's degree in theology and all that junk. Most of the people that wind up in those places wind up infidels. Amen. All you need is this book right here and the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and you've got everything you need. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm the first and the last. I'll show you everything you need to know. And if Jesus don't show it to you, you won't get it anyway. Amen. I tell people that all the time. If God don't show you what's in this book, I can't show you. I can teach it to you, but until the Lord puts light on it for you to see it, you won't get it. He has to reveal it to you. Amen. All right, we'll pick up there next week, guys. Um, we'll pick up there and start talking about the Alpha and Omega and the first and the last. We'll pick up a little bit more on that and show you some Old Testament references to those. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness. Thank you for the people that are here today that are hungry for your word and craving to hear. Thus saith the Lord, I just pray, God, that you'll encourage them, be with them, and bless them. Keep us safe, Lord, until we come together again. And Lord, as every head is bowed, I just want you to bow your heads for a minute. I want to give you an opportunity here today. I don't know everybody here is spiritual state, but I want to give you an opportunity if you're here today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior. You want to get saved today. You want to get that thing right. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how good you uh, can be. It's not about giving this up and giving that up before you come to Jesus Christ. It's about coming to Him just like you are with your mess and letting Him save you and He'll fix the rest. Now, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to pray for you and I want to give you an opportunity to get saved. Are you here today and say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I want to get saved. Is there anybody? Anybody? Everybody saved? Okay, we'll close in prayer again. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the saints of God gathered here in this meeting today. And I pray, God, that you continue to encourage and bless them, Lord, and help them to grow in grace and mercy until we come together again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.